Good evening, everyone, and welcome. The Lake Spear Railroad Museum is proud to have you all here this evening. And I want to say this is our 50th anniversary year of the Lake Spear Railroad Museum. And we got here because of vision. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, is the vision that brought us all here 50 years later. Dave Schauer will talk about the early years of the Lake Spear Railroad Museum and its 50-year anniversary, which is kind of interesting because he's only 35. <laughs> so it's a rather difficult topic, but I understand he's had some great help from other veterans, and of course he is a veteran himself, and uh, I think we're in for a great presentation. I'd like to say also that we're doing something uniquely different. Uh, this is being streamed live on Facebook and YouTube, and it's streamed all over the world. The Lake Spear Railroad Museum has almost 1,200 members. Our 1,000th member came from Sweden, and I hope they are watching this evening. If not, this will be available on YouTube at a later time, archived on our YouTube page for the Lake Spear Railroad Museum. So it was vision, an incredible vision. Don Shank always said there'd be a railroad museum in Duluth, Minnesota, and he meant it. He started the collection actually at the very end of the steam era when he put the 227 in the roundhouse at Proctor and wrote on the boiler in big letters the word save because that was his vision. There would be a railroad museum in Duluth, Minnesota. With the help of Wayne Olson, Frank King, Shirley Swain, other great volunteers, certainly the Lake Superior Transportation Club, Lake Superior and Mississippi Railroad, those early founders that brought us here today, and of course, the volunteers that made it all possible. What Dave is going to tell you tonight, tonight is that vision and how it progressed and how, and how it manifests itself today and how we entertain hundreds of thousands of people over the years and at least 200,000 every year between the railroad and the museum and the St. Louis County Depot, which was made possible by the creation of the Lake Spear Railroad Museum as part of that vision. We will tell that story, we won't, but Dave will, with the help of others. We will take you through this story as seen through the eyes and hearts of the volunteers that made it all possible, and the members of the Lake Spear Railroad Museum as well. USA Today voted the Lake Spear Railroad Museum as the best transportation museum in America, and we, and we very hungry, very hungry single day. It gives me great pleasure this evening to welcome our viewers who are streaming this evening and those who will watch this later on YouTube. We have a very important guest who will share this story because he lived a lot of it and still does today. Dave Schauer is a longtime member of the Lake Spear Railroad Museum, past president of the Mesabi Road Historical Society. He is a member of the Lake Spear Railroad Museum Board of Directors. He is vice president of the North Shore Scenic Railroad and a great friend of the museum. He joins other board members here this evening, Tom Gannon, our curator emeritus, who was standing in a field, and then they built a railroad museum around him that he did most of the work for. Dr. Tim Zager is here, also on our board of directors, and our president of the Lake Spear Railroad Museum, Dr. Neil Vanstrom. A round of applause. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this evening. I know you're in for a great time and a great treat and wonderful education. Please welcome a dear friend of the museum, Dave Schauer. Thank you, Ken. Uh, can everybody see me? I don't I need a phone. <laughs> Good evening, and it's a wonder wonderful evening here in Duluth uh, tonight. And what I would like to do is uh, first off uh, thank Tim Shandell, uh, who uh, helped me put this presentation together. and. Tim and myself, uh, as well as a number of audience members, have uh, lived the early mentioned has turned out to be one of the best in the country, if not the best railroad museum in the country. And what I intend to do tonight is walk through the first 20 years when everything started to come together and all the hard work that went into making this museum what it is today. It starts with a building. But it's the people that make the building and what's in it important. If you look up on the screen, you can see 
an image of Union Depot, Duluth Union Depot, dud, if you will, anything but a dud today, right? That vision is seen in 1969. It was urban renewal. If you look across Michigan Street from the Union Depot, urban renewal has already started. The Bowery, if you will, has been removed. And some of the new high rises, some of the uh, affordable living buildings are starting to be constructed. And you can see the Sioux Line Depot. The Sioux Line Depot was not as fortunate as Duluth Union Depot as we all know today. The Sioux Line Depot is no longer with us, sadly. But Ken has mentioned time and time again about how the Sioux Line Depot had structural issues and when the decision came to pick a depot, Union Depot won and, and we're grateful for that. Look at the bottom left hand image. That's what it looked like and, and that's part of the field that the museum was built around is, is Tom was standing there. But this is actually, or this is 1969. The last train to leave this facility, May of 69, was a Northern Pacific Bud car from Duluth to Staples where it connected with the North Coast Limited out to the West Coast. You wonder how much change has happened over those years? You take a look at this, you can see. But there are still some things that stand out to me. The parking ramp, which you think that's a modern urban renewal project, is still there today. And that little, little building, excuse me, this, this little building here is still there, you know, where they used to take the, the money for parking in the ramp. A lot has changed. But it is about the people, and it's about that vision. This is an image uh, courtesy of Gordon Mott, who we'll uh, talk about briefly in a minute. But you can see some of the key movers and shakers, if you will, in this image. You have Donald B. Shank, who Ken mentioned, in the center. And this is right in front of the model building here. Vice President and General Manager of the DM&IR, you know, this is the museum that Don built with his vision. Everything in this museum in the first 20 years, Don had something to do with, some input on, and the fact that we even have a museum here is thanks to Donald B. Shank. Don unfortunately left us in 1993, and that's at the end of our 20-year window here. He left us too early. Standing next to Don on his, that would be his left side, is Shirley Swain. She was the first executive director of the St. Louis County Heritage and Arts Center, which is what the name of this building and this entire complex was known as for many, many years. Today it's known as St. Louis County Depot, but it was the St. Louis County Heritage and Arts Center, and Shirley Swain was the first executive director of the facility. And while not involved intimately with the Rare Museum, it was her vision to see what this entire complex could do and the future of the complex. And if you look back and, and where the complex is today, Shirley had a lot to do with that. Okay. If you look to Don's right, you'll see another lady, one who was very instrumental in our museum, and that is Marilyn C. Persh. Marilyn was Don's executive secretary. Now, she was the gatekeeper to Don. So if you're wanting to do business with the DM and IR, wanting to contact Don, she was the lady. But known in the museum here, we have a fantastic exhibit known as the China Car. She was very much into railroad dining car China. And she was also very impactful in her role with the National Association of Railway Business Women. And through her position with that group was able to acquire collections of dining car China. And more importantly, she was able, through her connections with the DMNIR, to have a coach donated, a wood coach, and then she painstakingly with a number of dedicated volunteers saw that that car became home to our collection of dining car china. Just a phenomenal collection. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to do so. It's over on track two right behind me. Now this event, and this is courtesy of Gordon's memory, Gordon B. Mott, is that the gentleman on Maryland's right is the Earl of Lindsay, if I said that right. Um, and he's presenting Marilyn with a commemorative plate from British Rail, of all places. 
and this was a big event at the time and you can see that's why all the movers and shakers were in this picture but we're glad Gordon thought enough to take this picture Kay. if you look off second from the left the gentleman standing there is, is Larry Summers and he was the first executive director of the Railroad Museum he was half and half with the St. Louis County or kind of half and half with the St. Louis County Historical Society but he was entrusted early on with uh, the bookkeeping the administrative side of running a rare museum which once you grow it, it becomes very very important as Ken can attest to how, how many of your hours in a day is administrative right okay moving on to some other individuals I thought were very important to the museum you can see Frank King he's in the upper photo on the left and Frank was the one in the uh, engineering department for the DM and IR and most people know Frank King as the author of the Mesabi Road and, and Minnesota Logging Railroads uh, definitive books on both of those subjects he was very instrumental early on on getting equipment working with Don working on the LS and M in the early years and he was a great guy uh, again he left us too early uh, we lost him in 1985 in the middle is Gordon B. Mott at the time in the early 70s uh, Gordon who is currently a board member was a, an executive local railroad official with the Burlington Northern and he worked very hard with Burlington Northern and the museum and he was a volunteer he, he was not afraid to get his hands dirty and, and you'll see some additional pictures later on on his right or on his left is um, Phil Larson Phil Larson was the general manager of the BWP and in those early years it was so critical to have local railroad officials involved in the museum both from a donation standpoint and getting free railroad moves getting equipment restored it was absolutely critical to have that local connection with the railroads nowadays the local officials don't nearly have as much autonomy and control as they used to back in the early 70s now everything is run through Fort Worth or Montreal or wherever the, the railroad is headquartered Omaha okay if you look on that upper right that's Gordon again and you can see Leo McDonald Leo became involved heavily later on in the 1970s but early on he was um, he wore many hats uh, Leo, Leo was amazing uh, he originally his 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 railroad love love of railroads began when he was in high school just out of high school and that he worked for the DWP the Duluth Winnipeg and Pacific and he never lost that love of railroading and he wore many hats he was in city administration his background after attending college was the legal field so he drew up a lot of papers including getting the st. Louis County Heritage and Arts Center going he was on some of the legal teams that put that together but he really became involved late in the 70s being a Morgan Park res resident when the LSNM came the, the Lakes River Mississippi Railroad he became more active and then he evolved into the position you know I, he was everything in the museum but a, a wonderful gentleman and he passed in 2011 but I, I loved hi listening to his stories that was Leo and then of course Wayne Olson who you will hear a lot during this presentation Wayne C Olson worked for the housing um, authority in Duluth and he was um, from the get-go he was one of the movers and shakers in the development of the museum he held just about every position both in the club on the LSNM and in the museum a board member I think he was president of the board at one time and he was um, he was probably the most active in terms of hands-on of all of our board members in those early years he was down every Saturday he'd come down every Wednesday night and he would get his hands dirty and uh, just a wonderful uh, addition to the museum and, and um, he um, left us in 2004 again again too early he had more years to give to his both his family and, and the museum but you'll see pictures of him coming up and you'll just see how just how hands-on Wayne was that picture was the last train out of this depot May of 1969 he rode it with two of his sons in the foreground he rode it to Carlton where his wife Mary Ann picked him up and there weren't that many people there but Elliot Haycock is is one of our early members of the transportation club he's the gentleman there in the suit coat and he uh, rode along with Wayne on that last train so it was very fitting Wayne was in that was rode that last train and then became instrumental in developing the railroad museum at the depot
most most individuals don't know this, and I find it quite interesting myself, but the Railroad Museum was basically formed, the, the Heritage and Arts Center, in 1973. That's kind of why we're celebrating 50 years. But the museum itself really didn't open to the public until 1975. Everything had to be done, a lot of work in the museum had to be completed and, and exhibits, frankly, brought in before it was open to the public. There were special events. There were some special events before the actual unveiling. But uh, thanks to member, longtime member Mark Olson, he did keep and he scanned the invitation to the premiere, premiere showing, and you can see the date there, June 3rd of 1975. And that's when it was open to the public and individuals started coming in, and, and Tim Shandell reminded me of this. He said the, the, the admission price, if you can take a guess, 25 cents, a whopping 25 cents to view the museum. Such a deal, right? I think we're at $12 now, aren't we, Ken? Something like that? Okay. I should say, and, and, and that I'll back up one. Uh, in that photo, courtesy of Gordon Mott, is Gordon Mott on the left, and then Tom Hoff, who was also an early instrumental I, th I believe he worked for Burlington Northern, didn't he? Down in um, St. Paul. And then you've got Wayne Olson, who I mentioned, on the right. Okay, Tom. Tom is, Tom is in the audience, and, and no slideshow on, on, on the Railroad Museum would, would be complete without at least mentioning Tom. He's our curator emeritus, and we, we've always liked this photo. I always liked this photo. Uh, Blamey, John Blamey was our official photographer, the museum's official photographer for those first 10 years, and John Blamey at Blamey Studio in, in the West um, Spirit Valley neighborhood of Duluth. And he had a little fun with Tom, and they did a double exposure, so there's two Toms. And one thing we always used to laugh about is that, well, Tom, if we can get two of you, why not three, four, five, six? Right? Not sure he liked that idea, but one, one of the inter interesting things about Tom is the man is fueled on... I guess a little bit of caffeine, but it, it, anybody in this audience knows what Tom's favorite drink is. It dates back to the first years of the museum. Nobody? Tom was doing the do way before most of us. And, and it, it brings up a story. Tom would always put a, a fresh bottle of, of Mountain Dew in, in the refrigerator in the model building here. And one time, and Tim related this story, one time one of our newer tour guides went in and we stocked the refrigerator with pop for the tour guides and you could go in and get it while there was a Mountain Dew there. Mmm, that looks good. Well, she cracked it open and swigged it down and let's just say that was the last time she ever did that. <laughs> one thing about Tom, he could always make you smile with that uh, dry sense of humor and, and, and always a... a flash of that uh, smile of his. This is a good example of that. You can see um, right in front of our model building here, uh, the individuals in this image uh, from left to right. You have Dave Carlson, who I'll speak to in, in a few slides, speak about. You have Tom Lamphere, who is the president of transportation for Burlington Northern. Like I mentioned earlier, it's always nice to have railroad officials on your side. They didn't get much bigger than Tom Lamphere or as friendly as Tom Lamphere was for this museum. The amount of equipment he saw donated here, the number of fan trips he arranged as fundraisers. So I, I do want to mention Tom Lamphere. Norm Livgard is in the center. Norm Livgard for a number of years was the surveyor for the county of St. Louis. And he was also instrumental in the early years on Lake Superior, Mississippi. He was a board member, a past board member. And uh, Storm and Norman, as we used to call him, and he, he drove a tough, him and Dick Hansen, they, they drove a pretty tough uh, section gang out on the LSNM, and I can attest to that. What, you're tired? What, those mosquitoes? Come on, keep moving. They won't bug you if you keep moving. Um, I don't see him in the audience tonight, but uh, Chuck Jensen is the gentleman on Tom's right, and Chuck is uh, one of our current members. He's a volunteer in the North Shore Scenic, but he's been involved for the length of the museum very early on in the years and I was hoping uh, Chuck would make it this evening. Hopefully he's uh, online watching. Okay, I gotta talk about the tour guides. I was one of them. When the museum first opened, you know, there was no electronic interpretive displays to speak of. We had very rudimentary signage. 
to explain what equipment was and the best way to fully experience the museum was to have a guided tour. And one of the things we did is we hired tour guides, usually folks in college. And you can see in that upper photo, upper slide, upper left, this was coined early on, and I didn't coin it, but uh, it was called Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> uh, Tim Shandell, uh, who um, helped me, obviously, with, with putting this presentation together, and I'm very grateful for that. He was the um, senior tour guide. He had been there long enough, and he was the senior tour guide, so he oversaw the tour guide group. And it was mostly females, not many males, although we did have s a few, and, and one of those is on the far right, and that's Greg Ackland. Greg and Tim and his brother Tim were volunteers, and, and Greg was actually an employee. And you can see Greg dressed up funny one time. That's the official tour guide outfit, kind of. He, he put his clothes on in the dark. But one thing about Greg is when I was a young volunteer, Greg lived by me in the Indian neighborhood of Duluth. And in the summer when I was off of school, he would pick me up every morning and bring me down and then take me home. And I'd roam around the museum and have fun and do the things, you know, what 12 and 13 year olds do. And, you know, it's the love of the railroad. But that's Greg Eklund. And, and he did drive a green, I think it was green, uh, Volkswagen Bug to show you how many years ago that was. Uh, down in the lower right, lower left if you're looking at it, is um, Gail Gronseth. And Gail's in the audience tonight. Thank you for attending, Gail. But she is showing what tour guides did. They pointed a lot. They talked a lot. And it's been how many years since I was a tour guide, but I still remember the script on most of this equipment. And Gail's either talking about the fact that this locomotive, the Minnetonka, which I'll talk about in a minute, was a saddle tank locomotive. It carried its water over its drivers, or she's pointing at the stack saying, you know what, that's a balloon stack, and it was a wood burner. They needed to have a spark arrestor and a stack like that so they didn't start fires, right? I mean, that's, that's what the script was. And then, um, of course, in the center, you know, back many moons ago when I looked a lot younger, um, you can see um, in the model building, that's me in the center. And then um, on the end, on the left side, is Randy Shandell, Tim's brother. And Randy, in, in that capacity, was in charge of the mechanical staff in, in, in the Union Depot. So he was a good one to have here, too. And, and he, had, he was a whiz with um, mechanical things. He had a knack for that, and especially his love for passenger cars. If you ever need to know about a Waukesha generator, Randy was the guy to go to. And um, it, it was a lot of fun to look at look back at these images and remember the individuals that have crossed paths through the museum over the years, and Randy was one of them. He's recently retired as, uh, from the ENLS Railroad, Eskenam and Lake Superior. A few things, if you look in the upper left, the museum started off pretty rudimentary. Our ticket, ticketing area was a desk, literally an office desk, and we called it the desk. And in behind the desk was a little cabinet where we sold all sorts of knickknacks, as many as we could squeeze in there. If you look on the right, you can see, I think that's Marianne Burke and Tim. And, and above Tim's head is how many tours we gave on the half an hour. And, and you, we needed to have quite a few tour guides on hand back then to do that. You see Tom and his, uh, I wouldn't call him harem, but and Dave, Dave Bruns kind of uh, breaks up that <laughs> picture. But uh, we used to have Hogue. It, uh, those of you that remember uh, Hogue, the Hogue family, uh, Brian Hogue is, is more my age that I remember, but his dad um, made buttons and mugs, and we used to sell quite a few of those here at the Rare Museum. It's a funny thing, uh, funny what you remember. We upgraded. We went from a desk to what they call the cage. And I remember the... the, the, the Folks, the tour guides would say, we call it a cage. Tom did a beautiful job, but it feels like I'm in jail. <laughs> but you'll notice that there was a lot more selling space. There was a lot more display space around that particular cage, and that actually helped us sell a lot more merchandise in the museum. A presentation on the museum would not be complete without a big part of what made the museum great. And that was the Lake Superior Transportation Club, formed around the same time as the museum, 73. It might have even been formed slightly before that.
but the transportation club was the sweat equity that went in to the railroad museum. Group of individuals that loved railroading, wanted to see the museum succeed, and came together to form a club. And that club still exists today. It's, it's not in its same form, but I'm happy to say it still exists 50 years on. The gentleman seated in the middle, and I'll speak about him, is David Carlson. Dave was to the club what Don was to the museum. He was the mover and shaker of the, of the club, and he worked for the Burlington Northern as a clerk, but his real knack was crew calling. And in, in his case for the club is he was a volunteer caller. And, and this, is the, this is the time before you know, caller ID. So you'd pick up the phone and, hello, it's Dave. Yeah, we're putting a crew together to do such and such. And, and he had a way about him. You couldn't say no. And he was able to get the bodies into the museum to do the projects that needed to be done. And you can see on, on the left is Mark Olson, another early charter member, if you will, of the club. And you'll see some of his images coming up. He graciously allowed us to use some of his images. But Mark was an early club officer. And then on the other side of Dave is his brother Dale. Dale and Dave were inseparable because they were always here doing the projects and seemingly at the same time. Okay. Uh, completely opposite personalities. Uh, Dave was very outgoing. You had to be to be a crew caller and, or a volunteer caller. And then Dale was just put his head down, get the job done, um, have fun, and go home. Okay. Yeah, Dick Hansen mentions that Dave Carlson was also instrumental in getting the crew called for the LSNM. These are some of the projects you can see in the upper left, clearing out the tracks. The tracks had flooded the, the, the system coming off the hill and, and the way it was routed, we would often see flooding in the back 40, the back of the property. And the, the silt and sediment that would come off the hill, it created a lot of problems. Made the grass grow nice, but created a lot of problems. And so one and, and the whole drainage in the back has been greatly improved through the years. You see Bob Mortensen is one of the, the gentlemen on the far uh, left. Uh, he was a big member in terms of volunteering, uh, very active. Yeah, Frank King is in the back. I mentioned him earlier. That's his son, Philip, in the front. Um, I believe that's Angela Fina. Fion Fiona? Something not, not Fiona, not Disney. And then, of course, Tom. And then you can see in the upper right, uh, one of the big jobs was restoration of equipment. Tom couldn't do it himself, and this might even have been before Tom was hired as curator, but you couldn't do it yourself. A lot of work. These cars didn't come in like they were freshly shopped out of the railroad's back shops. They came in looking like they had been in service for 50 years. I don't know who that gentleman was, and Tim and I uh, scratched our heads. Looking back at an old newsletter, it might have been George Elliott. I don't know if anybody r recognizes that name or him. But we struggle a little bit with who that individual is. But in one of the newsletters, it said he led the charge to restore that reefer car. Uh, down in the lower left, you can see Bill Michelson, uh, a wonderful individual who I um, admired greatly. He was a retired executive from American Airlines. He moved to Duluth and spent many, many hours on museum projects, LSM, uh, North Shore Scenic. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful gentleman. I wanted to make sure he was recognized for his efforts. In the uh, bottom right, that's uh, Bob Bloomquist, one of our first members. I think he started a year in after the museum was formed. And he was another individual that was uh, important to me in that he would offer rides out to the LSM for work projects. He's one, along with Dave Bruns, that got me into photography. He said, hey, have you ever taken a picture of a train? I said, no, what's that, what's that about? Well, look at me now, you know. <laughs> a million photos later. But um, one of our big projects was uh, stripping paint off equipment and repainting it. Tom would do it, but we would do the stripping. Yeah, thanks, Tom. <laughs> Some of the other things the club was very important with and the museum were model railroad shows at malls, displays at malls. This was part of an early outreach. Where would you go? Maybe not so much today, but where would you go You know, 50 years ago? The Miller Hill Mall. It was the place to be. Well, you can see one display. That's for the museum artifacts. You can see a number of things there, including one of the signs for the Laker. 
which was the Sioux Lines crack passenger train between Duluth and Chicago. Also model railroading. The club uh, was built with many people that enjoyed model railroading. It's, it was different 50 years ago. Model railroading was a huge hobby. It still has a very strong following, but it was a huge hobby back 50 years ago. What you see there's Dave Bruns, who was a consummate model railroader, uh, very active in the museum, and we had built what we called a modular system. Club members would build a six-foot section of a scene, and they were designed to interlock together so all the mainline tracks were together. And we would transport these to the mall and spend you know, countless hours trying to get them all lined up and working properly. And many line, even as a kid, I remember, boy, this is late. Why are we at the mall at midnight? But it worked, and it was great outreach. And, and more importantly, it's how we generated new membership for the museum and the club. A very great outreach project for us. Another thing along the lines of model railroading were model railroading clinics. The Ruth Maney room over here, which has since been converted, but it was a great opportunity to put out flyers and let individuals come in, and we showed them how to make model railroad dioramas, work with model railroading, and have fun. Dave Bruns, John Schrammick, and Bob Pillsbury, you can see Bob and um, Dave in that image, would have people gather around and they were very well attended and I used to love to attend them because I would learn how to put model tracks together, build model freight cars, wonderful time. Field trips. Early field trips via bus or by train to the Twin Cities to visit other museums, other model railroad shows, flea markets even. It was a wonderful time and it, it was really a family type atmosphere. Everybody got excited. Let's get on the bus. The bus leaves at such and such time. And uh, again, Dave Carlson was one who really promoted getting the club out and doing more than just scraping paint on railroad cars. A few other things you can see that upper left photo, Dave Carlson, Tom Gannon with his uh, Jack Nicholas uh, pants on, uh, Bob Mortensen in the center, and uh, the gentleman on the right in that image is Pat Doran who is well known as a railroad author and, and professor. Uh, many, many books, uh, wonderful. And in fact, my first book that I bought was from Bonanza and it was uh, Iron Ore Railroads of the Lake Superior. And I still have it today and I got him to sign it. But uh, Pat um, was wonderful in the museum, a very good individual. And uh, what was interesting is when I was attending UMD, I as a professor, he taught a class, Principles of Transportation. My favorite class at UMD, and you can imagine why, because it was very railroad focused, and I loved it. Photo on the right, uh, Short Line Park. Some of you in this uh, audience attended that uh, moving of a speeder shed from the Northern Pacific. This is out in the Gary neighborhood. You wouldn't recognize it today because CN's main line cuts right through this area. But that was the uh, motor car shed, and it was a big event. We moved that from Short Line Park down to the museum. Bottom image, scavenging scavenging trips. This is down in the Twin Cities and of course the passenger business had faded. Burlington Northern had a whole bunch of surplus cars. This was a dining car and we sent a crew down, the transportation club sent a crew down to pick pieces off these cars to help rebuild our cars, Lake of the Isles being the primary recipient. But a lot of good memories. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the junior club because that's how I got my start. If you look in the upper left that's a good friend of mine, John Vincent, and that's Steve Olson. That was uh, Wayne Olson's youngest son who accompanied him down to the museum on numerous occasions. And the museum was donated through the, the generosity of Phil Larson, remember the DWP general manager, six outfit cars, bunk cars as they were called. We, uh, the museum immediately sold three to the Andorotic, Andor what do you say that? Anyway, New York Railroad, and we kept three, and one of them was allowed to be used for the junior members for a model railroad. And we took great pride in that. That's me on the right painting it. And we had a great time. We never finished the model railroad though. I b we had great bench work, but we never uh, finally got to the point of having an actual model railroad. But you remember things, you know, years on. And, and what I remember most about that bunk car was the fuel oil smell. There was a little fuel oil furnace there. And when I came home, my mom says, where you been? You smell like oil. And we were in the bunk car. But lots of great memories. And that was that fed the volunteer groups 
as we aged. One of the other things that was very interesting as we call it the Arrowhead Civic Club. For 50 years, this was a civic organization in the Twin Ports that in conjunction with the Northern Pacific would operate a passenger train to Moose Lake for underprivileged children. This was their big event of the year. And as transportation club members, later on, we would help staff that train because the Arrowhead Civic Club didn't have the staff to handle it. And this was one of those exciting things every July we would, you know, in conjunction with the BN and, and the Civic Club, run a train to Moose Lake. Well, BN abandoned the line to Loose Moose Lake. So where did we end up going? Well, then we went over to Iron River on the BN's Ashland line. And you can see that top one is the 50th anniversary. Down below is, is we're unloading in Iron River and, and the underprivileged children and their chaperones would go to Half Moon Lake. They'd walk in Iron River about a mile or two miles to Half Moon Lake on a hot day, but then they'd go swimming, and it was fun. This is the last trip. This was 1985, and I snapped this picture. I said, guys, I think this is the last trip because this line's going to be abandoned. This is the last train to Iron River. So I gathered up as many of our volunteers as I could before the return, and we just took a snapshot, and to this day, I'm happy I did. Bloomquist, you saw earlier. Dale Carlson. Steve Olson, he's a lot taller than he was in that other picture. Uh, Dave Carlson, of course, is in the center. Uh, Jay Wolf, good friend of mine, is above Dave. Uh, Bob Wood, you can see, and then Tim Shandell, and then um, Pat Doran's son, Tom Doran. Surprisingly, or not surprisingly, given our age, but he's nearing retirement as an engineer for Canadian National, but he's on that far right side. Potluck dinners and Christmas parties. Like I said, it was it was a family environment. The transportation club did so many things. But to the, today, there are still volunteer dinners, but this was, hey, we don't have any money. Everybody bring a good dish. And I, some of the best food I remember as a kid was attending these potluck dinners where some of the best cooking in, in the Twin Ports was laid out and Christmas parties, the same thing. In fact, what I'm doing tonight was very similar to what we did at Christmas parties. And end of the year... We would put together a slideshow. Throughout the year, we'd take slides, and yeah, no digital stuff. We would take slides and then do a show of all the volunteers at the end of the year, and that was our end-of-year party. And we do it at Christmas party, and Peter Fifield and I had the pleasure of putting a few of those programs together, and it was, it's not like having PowerPoint, trust me. We used a, a machine called a Volenzak, and you had to use, oh, I, I won't go down that road, but it, trust me, technology can be your friend. And of course, uh, some of you in this room remember this, but on Saturdays was the primary work day for restoration in the museum. And one of the things we would do is we would have lunch. And there was a place in downtown called Mr. Nick's, famous for its charburgers. And we would walk up noon, have lunch, and then walk back. Well, that was a wonderful experience. If you've never had a charburger, it was great. Like I said, love is a charburger, as good as a charburger. But you can see in this picture, we would go up and they had a back room where we would go in the back room and have fun and eating. And they were known for their charburgers. Bob Mortensen loved conies, but I like their onion rings. And you get similar ones at, at the uh, Pickwick, if you're interested in onion rings. But t you can see in this image, Tom is in the lower corner. Dale Carlson, and that's Ann Raleigh. She was one of our early tour guides. And, of course, Steve Olson, a very young Steve Olson in the background. Okay, model building. Well, you're sitting in front of it. it. It looks nice. But this was one of the first things that the museum wanted. And that vision that Ken spoke to, vision was, let's put a model railroad together and show what the Twin Ports look like. Let's feature model, uh, models of railroads that serve the Twin Ports. And that, once again, was a major transportation club undertaking. It was built in 1974, and a lot of the work was done by a bridge and building class or crew from the DMNIR. There's that DMNIR Don Shank connection again. But obviously, it, it looks a lot better now, and, and you're sitting where this image kind of, kind of shows. The model building became our unofficial office. Uh, lots of hours spent in the model building. You can see Wayne Olson uh, giving a sermon on a, on a Wednesday night. Wednesday night was the primary night. It was Tuesday and Wednesday nights were model railroad nights, but Wednesday in later years became the primary night to work on the model railroad. 
In that image, I can see Tom's head in the background, um, yours truly with the green hat, uh, Mark Olson again, Wayne, uh, Bob Bloomquist, and Peter Fifield on the far right. One of the er early um, views of the model railroad. And then in the lower right, uh, a couple things I want to talk about here, because this is very interesting, and most people don't realize this. But in that image, uh, first of all, the individuals, you've got Les Seeger, the older gentleman, wonderful gentleman, uh, Dale Carlson again, they're looking over plans for uh, reconfiguring the model railroad. And then uh, Jim Long. Yeah, Jim Long was an awesome model railroader, and he was known for painting. But more importantly, he built and he put in the original wiring for the model railroad. And if you look behind him, you'll see the track layout. And what's interesting about this is his job at the Air National Guard was an electrician. And the power toggle switches to uh, put power to the tracks were aircraft grade, extremely expensive. And there were toggle switches, and he, I, he did, and Tim reminded me of this. Jim said, we use uh, these in the airplanes because if you put something in the middle, off to the right or off to the left, they're not gonna move under G-forces if they're in a fighter jet. And he said, you don't wanna know how much these things cost, but I got them secondhand donated, wink, right? So that was interesting, uh, the, the um, wiring of this model railroad, but what came along next was very fascinating to me. And this is to Alan Anway, who's in attendance this evening. Hi, Alan. You think, you know, you, you've got a phone with you, and it's, it's the most powerful computer on the planet. Well, think back to, I don't know, it was probably early 80s, Alan, somewhere in there. Alan, in his expertise, built a computer. Okay, he didn't go to Best Buy, there was none. He built a computer to run the trains automatically. We put photo cells in the tracks, and he developed a program where the trains would run on a schedule. And that photo cell would tell the computer if the train has left and if it's come back. And remember the timing on this. So this is probably the first, one of the first computer applications on a model railroad ever. And that's often overlooked. People don't understand that. And Alan, thank you for that, because as a tour guide, it was wonderful. I didn't have to go in there and all the time turn a train on or turn a train off. It, it was nice. So thank you. OK, let's move forward into the actual museum, look at a few things. This is through the years. You can see 1969, the last train has left. You can hear the wind whistling through the butterfly canopies. It's deserted. This is the early years of the museum. You're looking down, and what, I what I want you to pay attention to is I used as the center point in these images is that track seven bumper. You can see that in generally the same location in all these images. This is what it looks like today. If you were to go up the stairs, this is what it looks like. It's filled up, there's fabulous things, lots to do, lots to see. It's come a long way. Thanks to Tim and his collection, he was able to uncover a article of the first pieces of equipment rolling into the museum. And, and one of the first pieces was the uh, wedge plow number 19. And that if you don't have to read that, but there's an interesting uh, comment in there about the Yellowstone Mallee, which Ken mentioned earlier. And they said it was a steel locomotive built by the Union Pacific or something for the Union Pacific. It was, you know, back then, you know, Accuracy maybe might not have been as accurate. But that's Mark Olson working on the 19, getting it ready. Once again, club members doing some of the heavy lifting. And in the upper right, the Minnetonka became our signature piece, the first locomotive on the Northern Pacific, groundbreaking just west of here in Carleton. And you can see that's Don Schenkter with um, Menk and Bud, I believe, of the Burlington Northern. Again, there's that Burlington Northern connection. The gem, the gem of the museum, most would um, not have an argument with that comment. But was, is the Yellowstone 227, it's an M3 class, articulated locomotive, one of the largest in the world. Some would argue better than the big boy in tractive effort. Top photo is the dedication ceremony. It was part of a DM&I or Veteran Railways uh, Employees Association meeting. Look at that, look at all those chairs. That's when we had room to do that. You can see Tom and Frank King and then Phil Larson's up in the top of the locomotive 
as it's being eased in. We had to remove some appliances or something, didn't we, Tom, to get it in? Remember that? That was a big event. And coming down the hill, you can see uh, it was brought down on the back of, uh, not an ore train, those ore cars were used for braking. But it was coming down with a 900, which is a locomotive in our collection that was used for all of our iron mining. It was the first diesel on the Mesabi range. And interestingly, it's a year older than the Yellowstone. So. The Milwaukee Road uh, box cab electrics, as you can see off to your right in the museum here, were an arrival in 1977. And before that, we had the Minnetonka set up next to the Yellowstone, which to me was an awesome comparison in size, the small locomotive and the large. But the uh, Milwaukee Electrics arrived, and as a tour guide, I can say that individuals loved the Milwaukee Electrics, the visitors, the guests, because you could go through it. And the funniest thing I would say when I was giving a tour is I'd say, you know how loud this was? Mm, there was no sound. It, it was just the humming of tractions because we spent many hours in the museum. This is what it looks like today, not that I need to tell you here in the museum, but those following along at home. This is what it looks like, and, and we've just added, and we're very proud to show our, our signal display. Uh, Scott Parker and, and individuals that have worked with him to put this display in, it will have a, it's a ceremonial um, grand opening, if you will, in a few weeks. First, first locomotive in Minnesota, the William Crooks. See right over here, one of our prize exhibits is actually owned by the Minnesota Historical Society. When the Union Depot in St. Paul, it was on display there. When that Union Depot was closed, they had to cut it up to get it out of the building. And it was sent to the Minnesota Historical Society. I said, well, where can we display this? There's no place in the state of Minnesota to display this. Oh, wait a minute. What about Duluth? That brand new museum. What a beautiful place. So they shipped it up to the DM&IR. Again, Don Shank. And the DM and IR put it together, put it back together like Humpty Dumpty, and then they brought it down the hill. I've yet to see photos of that train coming down Proctor Hill, but I would love to. If anybody has them, I would love to see one. So that's now a prize exhibit. It is, like I said, owned by the Minnesota Historical Society, but it's on custodial loan here, and it fits in beautifully with our collection. The next first, second first, is the Minnetonka. I mentioned earlier. The first locomotive on the Northern Pacific, 1870. Groundbreaking in Carlton, Minnesota. There's still a sign in Carlton that shows you where the groundbreaking was. This is it uh, being unloaded here in the museum. A lot, lot, of, lot of different things, and this is probably a 76, 77 shot, somewhere in that era. Equipment coming in, you can see Pulling in, uh, back then it was, what do we have? Let's put it inside. It was a uh, wrecking crane from uh, Burlington Northern donated. And, and that little locomotive there was our pride and joy. That was, you know, nicknamed the Flying Outhouse. But it's, uh, it's a Mac, you know, Mac trucks, industrial locomotive. It was, uh, I think we got it from ASCON or Hyman Michaels back then, but it was reconditioned by reserve mining. That explains its cream and brown color. And that photo that I just popped up there is George, Se George Sennhauser, the superintendent of railroad operations at Reserve Mining. And he, was, he had to test it out. His shop you know, reconditioned it and painted it. He had to test it. So that's up in Babbitt, Minnesota, former Reserve Mining. Cabooses, uh, cars from the William Crooks, lots of things to put in the museum. And you can see we can change exhibits up. This is what it looks like today. If you were to walk over there right now, this is what tracks two and three look like today. Our 50th anniversary banners displayed prominently. Duluth and Northern, um, Duluth and Northeastern 28, a consolidation type, 280. That's 1974. It's one of the first locomotive exhibits we had along with the Mallee. It's being brought in. It had been co cosmetically restored. That's a Gordon Mott image. It went from being a cosmetic restoration to recently, thanks to the folks at Cloquet Terminal and then finishing off here at the museum, an operating locomotive. And that's the 28 a few years ago going by the William A. Irvin under steam. And today, we still have it, still under steam. It's now backdated to its original owner, the Duluth Masabi and Iron Range, as 332. 
fun stuff. And, and I know Scott Carney's in the audience. He's our steam master, if you will. So there it is, Scott. We'll, we'll see it this summer, right? Wink, wink. Another steam locomotive, and, and this was exciting. I remember at the time, this is November of 1977, and we moved this, the uh, locomotive from the zoo. How many remember the zoo locomotive? I don't necessarily remember the zoo locomotive. I remember the little train that went around the zoo locomotive as a kid. But we moved it from the zoo parking lot across Grand Avenue, imagine that today, and connected it with the Burlington Northern tracks that are still in place today, and we moved it to the museum. Huge undertaking, lots of individuals involved, lots of fun. That's, that's a story in itself. Yeah, Dick Hansen in the front row here s it is mentioned that the 2435 went into the zoo the same way, laying track, panel track as we called it, and hauling it up grade. I'd rather come down grade as long as you got air pressure. This is what it looked like cosmetically coming out of the zoo, and this is what it looks like today, and that's thanks to Tom Gannon and a, a, a number of volunteers who have cosmetically rebuilt it. And I'm not just saying slap some paint on it. It's, it's been rebuilt cosmetically. Boiler jackets and all sorts of fun things. That's a labor of love, and, and Tom, it's beautiful. Okay, uh, Ken mentioned earlier, you know, that field in the back, you know, put Tom there, and we're going we're gonna to build a museum around it. Uh, this is courtesy of Doug Buell. Doug's in the audience tonight. Doug um, was one of um, our early photographers uh, working for Erie Mining, instrumental in their history, and today he's currently one of our um, volunteers in the library, cataloging things in the library, so we thank Doug for that. But this is a mining engineer's trip in 74, and you can see there's nothing there. And you know, we found a way to fill it. That's a more modern shot, and, and we only leave track seven open so we can have access to other things. Otherwise, I'm sure we'd find a way to fill it. This is a modern shot taken this winter. One of the things I wanted to mention was the McGifford log loader built right here in Duluth. An interesting, fascinating piece of equipment that I don't think is ever going to leave that spot. But as a tour guide, it was one of the more interesting items on our tour. And the number one thing that guests liked about it is when I explained, well, you just set the legs down and you can raise the wheels and you can move that little car underneath it. They couldn't fathom that, but the pictures we had up in display showed it very clearly. But one thing missing here, if you're very keen and you notice there's something missing in this photo, can you recognize what it is? Something is not like the others. And that's between tracks three and four. There's no butterfly canopy. The black item that was in our original photos of the depot, there's no butterfly canopy. And of course there's a story behind that. And I'll make it quick. For a, a fantastic railroad display in, in 75, late 75, local railroads brought all their best and finest, everything, and this goes back to railroads participating with us. The DM and Iris sent their most modern locomotive on the left there, in 1975 delivered SD38-2. Well, BN sent a ton of equipment. One of them was a tri-level auto rack. Anybody knows what a tri-level auto rack looks like? The thing's tall. Well, apparently it was too tall. And one of the butterfly canopies came in contact with the tri-level auto rack and down went the, auto, uh, the uh, canopy. It was removed and never replaced. Uh, fortunately, I don't think there were any injuries, just a lot of embarrassment. But, you know, things like that happen, and that's the story behind the story. Depot Square, again, um, just about everything in this museum, and I, I think that's a fair statement. You know, Tom Gannon's fingerprints are on, you know, both literally and figuratively. Depot Square was a phenomenal addition to the museum. All the buildings you see around here represent Duluth in three-quarter scale, if I remember my tour guide script. And they, it, it was a phenomenal, in, in conjunction with the St. Louis County Historical Society, uh, Tom and, and the, I think it was the Nazca brothers, if, if I remember right, helped build all of these displays. And you can see what it looked like before. I, I snapped that picture as the foundation was going in for what is the store over here. And you can see what it looks like after. It's 1982 is when it was dedicated. It was phenomenal. We picked up two trolleys from Lisbon, Portugal. They're narrow gauge. 
we wanted to show narrow gauge. In Duluth, originally, the trolley system was narrow gauge, as most cities were. And one thing about the trolley is that as a tour guide, you, you loved it and you hated it. If we didn't have volunteers running it, which we didn't initially, the tour guides did. And we'd give a little spiel. It ran out to the, where the shop is today. We'd give a little spiel. And you do that 50 times a day. And by the end of the day, you're getting a little tired. And your, your throat's a little sore. But I, and I remember, Gail probably remembers this too, it, it was huge because there was no real, you know, anything running. There was no North Shore Scenic. So if you wanted a train ride, hey, hop on. We'll give you a short train ride. Trolley in this case. You see Don Shank there at the uh, grand opening. Okay, this is a Doug Buell image. Thank you, Doug. Mainline excursions were a fantastic fundraiser for us. This is where the local railroads would bring their equipment. We'd use our equipment. And almost every year for the first uh, decade or so of the museum, we ran fundraising trains. This was the first, September 15th, 1974, from Duluth to Two Harbors. 300 passengers, very lucrative, made a lot of money for the museum. The railroads donated everything, crews, fuel, you name it. Who would have thought back in 1974 that less than 20 years later there would be regularly scheduled tourist trains up and down this piece of track? I, in fact, who would have thought Fitgers would be remodeled? Look at Fitgers. It was a rundown, abandoned brewery when this photo was taken, 74. I mean, he might have been cranking out something, Doug, but it doesn't look like much. One of the ones that still is brought up is the Freedom Ship, uh, Friendship Train, Freedom Friendship Train from Duluth to Fort Francis. Spent the night. It's the only train we've had where they actually overnighted. Sold out very quickly. It was put on by the Duluth, Winnipeg, and Pacific DM and Iron and the Burlington Northern. I think still to this day probably one of the longest trains that have operated out here unless maybe one of Sandberg's was longer, but I think it was 18 cars. Long, very profitable, and to this day it's remembered. And Gail remembers folding and sticking and mailing. That's Gail uh, and Tim. And one of the big things we had to do then was do, I learned more about bulk mailing as a young kid because I said, what does this S mean? Well, that means all, all those in that bundle go to the same state. So it's, it's funny what you'll learn working for the museum. 1988, Duluth and North, uh, Northeastern out of Cloquet up to Saginaw. Last year they were going to keep that track in service. So what do we do? Hey, make a phone call. Would you like to run a weekend excursion train for us? Sure, you bet we will. A lot of cool individuals in this picture, and I'll, I'll be relatively quick. You've heard their names before. Uh, Leo McDonald. That's Jeannie Gannon, daughter of Tom Gannon. Uh, Sherry, which is the daughter of Terry Matson. Of course, Wayne C. Olson. And Tim Zager. Tim, you remember that? I bet you do. And Randy Shandell, Tim Shandell, feeling right at home in Cloquet, their hometown. And Kent Ringel. Kent, you remember that? Mr. Cool. Kurt Halbrick, a local historian now living in St. Paul. I think he's still in St. Paul. Uh, Minnesota and international historian. I believe, Dick, that's your brother Gordon Hansen, if I remember right. Yep. And that is Alan Anway, I mentioned earlier. Hi, Alan, again. And then that's me. I was working first class. Normally, I don't like to wear a tie, but as you can tell, that was me. What fun time. Okay, we're in the home stretch, so hang, wi hang with me. One of the things that changed the dynamic here in the museum was the arrival of Amtrak in 1977 from the Twin Cities. They had been serving Superior for the first couple of years of their service until we could get a depot built, which is now the North Shore Scenic Railroad Depot. And that's a, a view from Mark Olson again of the first train. Feb I think it was February 15th of, what was that year? 77, that's right. And they were using two leased DMNIR SD9s. They were using those because they had steam heat back then. It wasn't electrical. It was steam heat, just like you see in the movies, right? One of the things that most people don't remember is we did do those railroad days, and we brought them back in in the early 80s. And one of the fun things I remember is the spike driving contest. The local section crews would get their teams together. Sioux Line, remember Sioux Line won. But it was Sioux Line, DMNIR, DWP, BN, you name it, Northwestern, and they would bring their section gangs over and have spike driving contests. And you can see that's in the photo in the upper right. Uh, lower left, uh, Joel Keefe was a, the station agent here for Amtrak. 
And those vending machines, I can tell you, the chuck wagons out of their microwave weren't bad. And I had plenty of them. And then um, Ron is on the right. Um, he was also a station agent. And he was, I, I wanted to use that photo because it shows him being interviewed by the local media. This train had nine lives. Unfortunately, it didn't have ten. And the train stopped running on Easter Sunday in 1985. And not many people photographed it because it had so many on-again, off-again funding issues with the state of Minnesota that everybody thought Willard Munger get back to life again. Well, guess what? He didn't. But who knows? We might see passenger trains back here again. Right, Ken? You never know. Okay, the biggest undertaking for the club and the museum was the revival, the resurrection from the dead, of the original rail line into Duluth, which was known in 1870 as the Lake Superior Mississippi Railroad, and that name has been reborn. And in 1979, it was donated by Burlington Northern to the city of Duluth. It ran from Riverside Junction, which is the Riverside neighborhood, for those familiar with Duluth, four and a half miles to New Duluth. And the city said, well, let's see about running a train out here. And we approached them and said, we can do it. Well. A lot of weeds, a lot of trees, a lot of ties, a lot of washouts, but we worked hard. You can see in that upper left photo, that was the first time we went out as transportation club members to try to start whacking all the weeds. That's in Mud Lake. That's the Mud Lake Causeway, uh, just across the river from all over Wisconsin. That's in uh, New Duluth. And you can see I was awfully small there. And a lower photo, that's in New Duluth, and that's Dave Sacchetti. He was an earlier... Uh, that he was a contractor that did a lot of heavy work for us, and he had, he had purchased from the city of Duluth, or maybe he was borrowing it, uh, a brush cutter. And he would bump, <laughs> I remember, remember seeing that orange, he, he would wear a silver hard hat, excuse me, silver hard hat, and he bounced down the ties riding that thing and thing. I don't know if that's getting the job done, but it did. And you can see Wayne Olson again. He w not only was he active in the, the museum, but he was active in the museum. He was out there you know, breaking a sweat like the rest of us. Lots of washouts, especially in Morgan Park. You can see one of the worst ones that had to be repaired. There's a group of us. Um, Alan, I think you're uh, on the bar there on the left. Jurgen Fear, Bob Mortensen, Frank King with the uh, hat on. And Bob Bloomquist, Mr. Spike. And I think that might be Dave Wood in the background, but I couldn't pull that out. Uh, lower, lower left, that's, that's the Pontiac. I think it's right over here, isn't it? That's our that's our Erie Mining Pontiac. We actually used it on the LS and M. And it was fun. Jurgen Fear was kind of the caretaker for it, and he's the gentleman getting a, working on his tan. And he would drive it home to his house in Lakeside and he'd said people would honk at him, wave at him and, and ask him to stop. They want to look at the car. It was an interesting, interesting car. It still is, and we're fortunate to have it in the museum. He said it burned as much oil as it burned gas. And then uh, we finally mechanized our operations to a degree, and Dick Hansen was instrumental in this. You can see the, the lower shot there. That's a ballast regulator, but we're still, you know, and, and Tim, I think, you, have you got steel toes by now, or are you still working with those loafers? But I don't <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, all right, yeah, Dr. Zager was on call. But uh, you can see Dick Hansen, who's here tonight. Uh, this is an image. You can see him in the background. That's Mark Olson. Uh, Zeke Fields, he was active in the museum for a while. You could always tell by his beard and his pipe. Remember Zeke for his pipe. July 4th weekend of 1980, it's back to life. There was no turnaround, a runaround track in Riverside, so we had to use two locomotives. That upper photo shows some of the key operational volunteers. Um, a couple that I'll point out. If you look on the, the right-hand side, that's uh, Larry Berlaga, son of Mike Berlaga, who's a member. And that gentleman there is Bill Bradley, who is the dad of Dick Bradley. And Dick is our current uh, membership secretary of the Transportation Club. First, uh, we used the, this locomotive here. was surplus Air Force, and we called it the Blue Goose. It was painted blue, Air Force, Air Force blue. I'm sure there's a special name for it. But we also needed another locomotive on the other end, and so we borrowed 
uh, Minnesota Transportation Museum, a very, very old locomotive nicknamed the Dan Patch. And they brought a couple of their volunteers up to help run it. A very interesting animal, very loud animal. And after that weekend, BN would haul our whole train back to the museum. And that's that other photo. You can see the train arriving back at the museum with a couple of Burlington Northern engines. It was fun. It was, it was a wonderful experience, and the excitement was there. Give you an example. Eight trips, four each day, we moved 1,700 passengers that weekend. That's not a bad number. Well, I asked our friend Josh in the back there what North Shore Scenic does on a July weekend with three trips a day, and we're currently doing 2,000 a weekend. So you can see the difference what location makes, and there was a lot of pent-up demand when we first started that railroad. I'll, uh, for those of you listening at home, I don't know if you heard that, but Dick Hansen mentioned a story about that push-pull operation with the Dan Patch on one end and the Air Force engine on the other, and his comment was the Air Force engine was, was pulling the train east, and they were struggling, and they said, well, we shouldn't be struggling with this kind of weight, and then they determined that the Dan Patch was going the opposite direction. They hadn't engaged its whatever <laughs> reverser or whatever they had. So they said, okay, guys, we need, to be, we need to be working together here. So that's an interesting tidbit from Dick. Thank you. This was our ticket office, uh, Caboose C9 in New Duluth. Story that, you know, putting up those signs and taking them down, that was a lot of work because we were in New Duluth. And let me tell you, not many people know where New Duluth is, and those are Duluth residents that don't know where New Duluth is. Try communicating that to, to uh, tourists. And there were a few issues. Uh, but I do want to say, in the defense of the LSNM, the speed limit was under 10 miles an hour. So when there was a little snafu, uh, it was always minor. There were no serious injuries or accidents. But I will tell you, when I worked the ticket office, which I did on numerous occasions, we had two numbers handy. One was the Burlington Northern. They'd come and put us back on the rails. But the other was the Duluth Transit Authority. They'd send buses so we could get everybody back to their cars. So two numbers, important ones. Yeah, Dick Hansen said he was a car host on, on that particular train, that specific train, and a passenger had asked, gee, do you ever have any derailments? Short time later, hmm, guess what happened? They jinxed it, Dick, you know that. Uh, that's our friend Alan Anway again, uh, obviously uh, out on, uh, this is the Riverside end, and to eliminate the need for two locomotives, we built a runaround track, another track at Riverside, so the engine can run from one end to the other, and we could eliminate the use of the other second engine. What's interesting here, a couple of things. Number one is uh, most of the ties in the rail came from the Duluth, Winnipeg, and Pacific's Hill Line, which it had been abandoned around that time, or their yard, or some tracks from that area. And that's where we were putting the track in. Now, behind Allen, you can see the charred remains of Alberta Gas. Those of us who've been around Duluth for a while remember there was a major explosion at Alberta Gas. And I think Mark Olson was the president at the time, but I remember... Dave Carlson calling, you know, getting this crew together. We've got to get this runaround in. And this was just a few days or you know, less than a week after the, the plant blew up. And so I asked Dave, and, and, and I said, well, are you sure it's safe to go out there? And he said, well, Mark says malic acid isn't, isn't dangerous. We can go out there. So, you know, Mark, Mark, or I think it was Mark, he'll let me know after the, the show, you know, <laughs> made the comment malic acid is okay. So, and I guess it is. Here I am. The big change came a few years later, um, mid-80s, 86, 87, somewhere in there, Dick, where we were able to secure trackage rights over the Burlington Northern to the location right across from the Duluth Zoo. We were on the map again. We weren't off the map. 
and the ridership figures skyrocketed and the LS and M uh, was feeding the museum and, and everyone was happy and we were making money. And then I think uh, that cake was made too and I thought that, that those were the good times. That's why I said we were all celebrating and I think that was a birthday cake uh, for Bob Bloomquist at the time. But that's also the time where the LS and M, up to that point, the museum, the LS and M became a separate corporation for liability reasons. The museum did not want to be affiliated for liability with the LS and M. And also at that time, the LS and M started to get its own equipment, not relying solely on museum equipment. And that locomotive you see there came from Flambeau Paper Company. It's painted in red and red and yellow, same colors that the switch engine that used to switch this building, this depot, is painted. And that uh, <laughs> that car there is, is a popular one at the time. It's been replaced since, but we used to call that the Vistagon. It was nice on a nice day. Okay, North Shore Scenic Railroad. That's a segue into the North Shore Scenic Railroad. I don't spend a lot of time in this because this is bringing us right up to that end of the presentation this evening, but the North Shore Scenic Railroad, 1990 is a key year, but before that, the DM and IR said, you know, we really don't need our track between Duluth and Two Harbors. We've rerouted traffic, you know, around the horn, as they will, up through the Iron Range and back down to Proctor, so we can get rid of it. Well, Don Shank, again, there's that name, said, oh, no, no, we, we've got to save this line. This is the future, again, a vision that, boy, this would be great running passenger trains out of the depot again, up the shore. Well, he worked along with others to see to it that that line was saved. It was sold by the DM and IR for a pittance. I think it was scrap value, two million, something like that. And back then, that wasn't a lot. It sounds like a lot. And it was um, sold to the Lake and uh, St. Louis County Regional Rail Authority. And that's what Indian Station or Indian Roundhouse looked like. That's about 20th, 21st Avenue East. It's under concrete now, of course. You know, I-35. And you'll see that. That's what that same view looked like in 1990, the first year we started running trains on the North Shore. And the first year, Don Shank formed a corporation just to get it running. And the LSNM, the, the Lakesburg Transportation Club, voted to move their operations from West Duluth to the North Shore line for 1990. Now, the year after that, um, the concession was put out to operate the line in the Gold Finds, better known for Gold Finds by the bridge and um, more importantly, the Vista Fleet, the Flamingo and things. And they won the concession to operate the line. So in 1991, the LSNM went to be back to being the LSNM, and then the Gold Finds took over operation on along the shore. But a couple of shots from 1990 to finish this slide. You can see what the lake walk looked like. It really wasn't a walk. It was kind of a walk in progress. And then the Regional Rail Authority did buy a bud car, which we still have today, which still kind of runs. Um, it, it will run. But nice uh, self-propelled car for shorter trains. Uh, what, you, know, you could run it with one engineer, one conductor. Just a couple of quick slides on steam because steam is important it, from an interpretive standpoint for the museum. Uh, steam is also very expensive. And there's a reason why railroads got rid of steam locomotives in favor of diesel. But from our mission uh, for the museum in 50 years, we've always felt it's important to have steam representative, live, living, breathing steam. The first locomotive restored was a locomotive near and dear to everyone who worked at the Duluth Works steel plant, number seven. It was restored through a grant, I think the Minnesota Historical Society paid um, a portion of it for the DM and IR to restore the locomotive. That first view is under steam at Proctor. The next view is a Gordon Mott image uh, when it came down to the museum. First under steam, 1981, I believe. That bottom slide shows the next big effort, and that was steam locomotive number 14. A uh, very uh, near and dear to logging railroad fans, the Duluth in northern Minnesota, it operated out of Knife River. You know, the thousands of tourists that drive by Knife River on their way up the North Shore have, have no idea the complex logging operation that was in place in Knife River. And this locomotive was their largest, one of their two largest, that operated there. And thanks to Tom and his, his band of um, people that remembered steam, which at that time we had quite a few that had operated steam and had worked on steam. And that's another thing why today with Scott and his team, we're educating younger individuals who have a mechanical mind how to maintain steam locomotives, how to operate steam locomotives. That, not 
just having the artifact isn't enough. It, it's that teaching aspect. Iron Will, this will bring us towards the end of the presentation. This is 1993 at the end of the 20 years of the first 20. This was big. This was really big. And number 14 helped us get this. This is Disney. It's a Disney film. It, I personally love it you know, I, because it was filmed here. But not only that, it really helped the museum financially. It, you know, Disney, when you say Disney, you know, ching ching, you know, it's, they've got money and they're not afraid to spend it. So Iron Will was filmed here in, in 93, 94. And you can see some of the images. That's uh, R14, uh, subbing is a great northern locomotive uh, on Proctor Hill being towed back to the museum after shooting, after filming. On the right is number 14. This is actually an earlier image in film or uh, photographed in um, Wisconsin on a um, Wisconsin Central excursion. But I wanted to show it because there's some uh, key individuals there. Warren Simons, who I wanted to mention, actually worked on Yellowstone locomotives, which shows that family aspect I'm trying to get across tonight of the Transportation Club and Museum, is that he is part of a three-generation family members who have volunteered for the museum. You have Warren, you have a son, Eddie, and then you have Eddie Jr. And, and uh, Warren isn't with us anymore, but Eddie and Eddie Jr. are still volunteers on the North Shore Scenic Railroad. Mark Olson came through, and, and you never recognize this. People, and some people know where this is, but this is at the foot of Clyde Avenue, Willard Munger Landing, and this is the filming where <laughs> Hollywood built a town. Birch Ridge, I think that's what it's called. But this is part of the filming, and, and Mark Olson was there, and he recorded some of this right along the shore. And, I, and, and Leo McDonald, who you uh, heard earlier, was an engineer and got a close-up in the movie you know, at the throttle of number 14. But if you talk, and, and Tim mentioned this, and it's, it bears repeating, if you talk to individuals in Duluth who were around at this time, somebody knows somebody who was involved with the movie because they had hundreds of extras, Duluth and Two Harbors. Rent it. If you haven't seen it, rent it. Seriously, it's a good movie. It's formulaic. I mean, it's the good guy wins, you know, after struggles. And All right, just uh, my last slide of the evening. I want to shout out to all of those volunteers and paid staff who communicated. Communication is such an important part of our business. You know, we communicate, we educate, and our publications have evolved through the years. Those first transportation club newsletters were basically an eight and a half by 11 sheet typed, no header, but it was extremely effective. You'd get that in the mail and you say, I know what's going on. I know what's going on at the museum. This is way before Facebook, you know, email. Yeah, this is the way it was. You, that mailman would deliver six days a week, or today in Duluth, three days a week. But what was nice is everybody knew what was going on. That evolved, and we actually upgraded to a masthead newsletter. And there it is. There's the Minnetonka. That was our showcase piece for communication. The Minnetonka. Not the crooks. It's evolved to the crooks, and, and understandably so. But back then, it was the Minnetonka. We added a few photos. It was mimeographed. Um, you know, it's kind of muddy, but you know, th it worked. And then we had a name change. We went to glossy paper. Great time for a name change. We had a contest with the Transportation Club, and the name Laker was chosen. Very appropriate. Sioux Line, name train, Duluth of Chicago. And more importantly, it played off the name of the museum and the club and the LSM. Lake, Lake, Lake. Perfect name. But as the club evolved out of publishing the newsletter and the museum became more professionally managed, the publication became more professional. Desktop publishing did wonders to upgrade this publication. And today we have a world class publication. And I would like to give a shout out to some of our former editors. I was an editor for four years in the early 80s during that transition to, to Laker. And trust me, being an editor is hard work. It's really hard work because you have to gather all the information. You have to kind of make sure it's accurate, 
then you have to get it to the printer you have to make sure it gets mailed on time under budget it's hard work but Jurgen Fuhr, uh, who I mentioned earlier uh, working on the LSNM and, and he was an editor of the Laker after I was for over 10 years that's a long time and then after the publication came in-house there were a few editors and then Kim Shandell the wife of Tim Shandell did it for I think 11 or 12 years and brought it up to the standard it is today and Kayla Sullivan our current editor is continuing that tradition and I look forward to seeing the junction four times a year when it comes out so that's the end of my presentation I, I'm happy to accept questions this is our first one of our first fancy signs um, in the museum but let's hope you know we're, we're here in 50 years and I know we will be but what will it look like in 50 years I mean I've been around for 45 of them and it's changed a lot and, and vastly for the better vastly so thank you any questions That was a fabulous job, Dave. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for everybody that helped on it. I know that Dave uh, mentioned them, but uh, this was really a team effort to put this together and to honor 50 years of the Lake Superior Railroad Museum and kick off our next great 50 years. Now, just to make sure that everybody knows how much we appreciate all the work that went into getting us here today, um, we could be here for how many more hours, Dave, uh, with the pictures we have and the people we need to thank, but know that we always think about all of our predecessors. We thank them for their hard work, whether it be a paid staff member or a volunteer, or most importantly, our board of directors who steered this company and this museum to where we are today. I thank you all for coming. I thank those who are watching on YouTube, and uh, it will be archived there as well, and on Facebook this evening. Most importantly, thank you all for coming this evening. Drive carefully on the way home, and as always, may God bless. <laughs>